central corneal topography with the Zeiss Eyewell Master 700. This is a really interesting innovation from Zeiss. There's no change in workflow. It's, it's using the technology you have currently to do central topography. The proposal here is that this is just part of your normal workflow. You're not changing software or hardware. You're reading the central corneal shape easily and intuitively, and you're detecting those visually relevant corneal asymmetries that might have an impact on your premium lens selection. And I'll go into some of the details of that. How do they do it? Well, they're just using the 18 telecentric spot locations, which they use currently. Uh, and they're interpreting the data and producing uh, two sort of maps, an anterior axial power map that you see here. And because they can use pachymetry and, and posterior surface curvature measurements with swept source, they can give a total axial power map. And so you have these two images, anterior axial, total axial power map. And uh, it's a bit like total keratometry. Now, total keratometry I use routinely in, in all of my eye well calculations. We've shown, it's published in this last few weeks, um, that in post-refractive patients, it leads to more accurate results. And we've got a very big database of close to 20,000 eyes to show that it also is helpful in picking up the occasional outlier, even in normal eyes. And so I use it in everybody. I'm not saying everyone should do that, but I'll go into some of the implications of that and its relevance to this central corneal topography. So again, I'm a skeptical person, so I thought, okay, I should compare these images to what I do with my normal topography, which is generally with Pentacam. And you can do this with whatever you'd use in normal practice. Here's a patient, a post full thickness corneal transplant, and the pentacam is on the left hand side. You can see there's a lot of astigmatism there, it's pretty steep inferiorly. And that's the anterior axial power map on the right. It looks pretty similar. It's been color coded to make it reasonably consistent, remembering that the anterior axial power map is based on about approximately four millimetres of central cornea, whereas the pentacam obviously goes over about eight millimetres or a bit more. Now that's the anterior axial power map on the left and the total axial power map on the right. You would expect in a post-corneal transplant patient for them to be a little different because the normal relationships have broken down. And that is the case here. You see some difference between the anterior and the total, and that fits with what this is attempting to do. That's the pentacam again on the same patient. And the pentacam obviously gives you more information. There's corneal thickness there, which is obvious to see. There's posterior corneal mapping. And so you get more uh, in this complex situation from topography, but you've got some very useful information already just from the eyewell master with no extra technology or extra effort. Here's a more typical patient. This is an older patient ready for cataract surgery, known to have a bit of mild dry eye disease. That's the pentacam on the right eye on the left and the anterior axial power map on the, left, on, the, on the right. You don't need to do the total power map uh, because this is a normal patient. Uh, you, you, you really what you're looking at is the surface here. And you can see a little bit of central and paracentral irregularity on pentacam. That could be basement membrane disease, but more likely tear film issues. You can't tell. And similarly, the anterior axial power map is telling you there's a bit of irregularity here, a little bit steep there superiorly, um, and that needs a bit of further uh, thought and looking at to determine what to do next. Uh, and that's the left eye of the same patient, same sort of process. Picks up on pentagam, picks up on anterior axial power map. When I think about it, I didn't need to do the pentagam there. I picked up the information I need, and I need to go back to the slip lamp and then decide what to do about this. Um, and I've been able to, to really uh, work that out based on the um, the anterior axial power map from the Zeiss device. Here's a different patient, patient with prior hyperopic LASIK. On the right, the pentacam. It's steep, it's a bit irregular. It needs Is that tear film or is it some irregularity from the LASIK? And the anterior axial power map telling me more or less the same. Remember, it's over a smaller area, so you've got to get used to that difference. You're not looking at eight or nine millimetres of cornea, you're looking at about four millimetres. And in a steeper cornea, which this is, it's effectively a little bit less than four millimetres sometimes. Flatter corneas, it's going to be a bit, bit bigger diameter. Um, not much difference here between the anterior and the total axial power map, even though it's a post-refractive patient. They're pretty similar images. 
and uh, that's obviously the the the, the pentacam in the same patient's right eye gives you more information. It's a, you get the corneal thickness, uh, and in that sort of eye, you'd probably want to have a look at the the, the regular topography. Here's the left eye though, same patient. Wow! If you'd done just the, you'd ignore the pentacam. If you'd just done the anterior axial power map, you'd think, oh gee, maybe that's a decentered ablation. Is the patient fixing properly? Um, and the pentacam gives you roughly the same information. Remembering it's over a bigger area, but that does certainly look like a decentered hyperopic LASIK ablation. Um, there's a difference here though between the anterior axial and the total axial power maps. Um, uh, not a big difference, but there's some difference as you would expect. And that's the overall appendicam image, and I think this was a decentered hyperopic uh, ablation. Here's a different patient, again, a post hyperopic LASIK patient. Um, again, I put this one up just to show you, you've got to think of this in, you've got to be used to looking at a four millimetre area. So when you look at the anterior axial power map, you think, gee, maybe that's keratoconus, it's really steep down there, but that's not giving you the full picture here. So it is helpful in this circumstance to have a bigger area of analysis. As you can see here, this is maybe uh, um, a little decentered, but there's certainly some steepening, but it flattens out towards the periphery, and you don't get that information. Um, from, from the anterior axial power map, you do need to go to a, 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 a wider area in that circumstance. And again, just to show you the, the subtle difference between the anterior axial and the total axial power map. Now this last patient, this last uh, example, I think is interesting. This is a normal, regular patient, cortical cataract ready for surgery. I look at the anterior axial power map and I see there's astigmatism there, a little bit flat overall, but normal. I'd say that's a normal eye. You could put a toric eye well in there, um, if there are other things being equal. And the pentacam is showing me more or less the same thing over a slightly bigger area. Look here though, the anterior axial power map in this normal patient is quite different to the total axial power map. And I think this is one of those outliers where it would be very helpful to do total keratometry um, in this particular patient. This is the one where you might have got a a refractive surprise using a toric lens if you didn't incorporate posterior corneal astigmatism. And you wouldn't have picked that up from the pentacam in the same way that it's easy to pick up by showing the anterior and the total axial power maps and the difference between them. And the, the pentacam doesn't actually tell me anything more that's useful. The left eye of the same patient, similarly pentacam anterior axial power map, on the power map, I can tell, yep, toric patient fits with the right eye. And again, a difference between the anterior axial and the total axial. This would have been a little surprise if you hadn't incorporated um, total keratometry, that is posterior corneal astigmatism. And so this is, you'd know this from just doing this screening test. Okay, this patient's good for um, a toric eye. Well, as I say, other things being equal. And in this particular circumstance, I might consider using total keratometry as part of my uh, I will power calculations, and I didn't really need to do this, which is the pentacam. I don't think it adds any useful information here. So I think my my take home message from um, central topography, having got myself familiar with it now, I try to answer these questions. Um, does it integrate into my normal workflow? Um, without changing things? Absolutely. And in fact, the staff, my good technical staff, look at this and alert me to things that I need to know about, just as they do with topography. Secondly, is it detecting relevant irregularities? It is. But remember, it's an approximate four, four millimeter area. So it's different to topography. It's not replacing topography. In some circumstances, it may mean that you don't need to do topography, but it's not replacing it. It's, it's a really good screening tool to help you with your uh, lens decisions. And thirdly, is it easy to do and intuitive? Absolutely. Um, I think for technical staff and for you, uh, it's not going to be an issue. So I think I think uh, it has its place. Um, and how you use this this interesting innovation from with the Zeiss IOL Master 700, it will be up to you and your the efficiencies you can make in in your practice. Uh, but I urge you to have a look at it. Uh, and, and uh, come to your own conclusions, but I'm certainly finding it's uh, it's got a valuable place in my practice. Thank you very much.